The more I study Bitcoin, I see more the value of Bitcoin. So much so that I owned a property. Uh, it was a condo in Miami and I sold that property. 2044, we could be looking at a full Bitcoin standard. It doesn't matter who's in power because our system, a debt-based system and fiat-based system is set up to favor the people in government and people at the top. I have a big place in my heart for the people in Zimbabwe. Many people there probably don't don't have bank accounts. Some do, but the bank accounts charge such high fees. Once you get to Bitcoin, where Bitcoin is your personal hurdle rate, it's hard to invest in anything else. Your most valuable resource is time. I saw some pictures that you were also at Bitcoin at the Bitcoin conference this year. I think even at Prague and at the Nashville one. Is that, is that right? I was only in Nashville. That was oh. my first conference that I've attended. How was it? The first Bitcoin conference. Now, now you know how, <laughs> how the, the conferences are and it's the biggest one in the world. So it's a nice one to start with. There were a lot of people. How was your uh, impression of the, the national conference? Is, was it uh, interesting for you or did you had any big takeaways from that? Just that there, it was nice to see so many people, like-minded people, you know, a lot of different backgrounds, even though Politically, they seem to support, you know, mostly Trump, but backgrounds all different. And yet we all agree on this one common Bitcoin perspective. And um, obviously everyone is on a different part of their journey, but I really like to see that common ground and, you know, being around Bitcoiners. Uh, it's it, the Trump thing is interesting because uh, I, f I feel like Bitcoiners are very cautious of, about, about Trump, at least the, the, the Bitcoiners that I know, because they're like, yeah, he is now a Bitcoiner, but he's not that long a Bitcoiner. And does he really understand Bitcoin? What, what, what's your take? Is Do you think he actually understood it? I think he understands it better than he used to. And I think he's being advised very well. And what I find interesting is, why would a U.S. president adopt Bitcoin when it goes against what the system is? That's you know, interesting. Why do you think this is? Well, you know, Jeff Booth always says it doesn't matter who's in power because our system, a debt-based system and fiat-based system is set up to favor the people in government and people at the top. So... While, while they might want to put Bitcoin into, you know, and, and it would absolutely help our debt, it, they are benefiting from this current system. So I just find it interesting and I just, I just am a little skeptical of how much they would put us on a Bitcoin standard. I'm also thinking maybe they realize that Bitcoin might be something. Uh, and, uh, if in the case Bitcoin actually catches on and it might be actually something that's just put some of them on our balance sheet, it's just like an uh, insurance policy for, <laughs> for the US dollars even because they have gold in their reserves. Um, but what if they just put also some Bitcoin in their reserve? Uh, they, they still can print as much as you, as they want. But with, if Bitcoin actually gets to a world reserve currency, status they only benefit from that i feel like and and maybe at some point the, the game theory of coming into bitcoin actually develops that much that they actually adopt the bitcoin standard in a way but still issue the us dollars for paying taxes and stuff like that well i'd love to see that so <laughs> and and obviously trump has been more pro bitcoin than than the democrats obviously um, Kennedy was even more not knowledgeable on Bitcoin, very knowledgeable, but he doesn't have the same backing that, that Trump does. So that was just interesting to observe and see. I would love to see uh, Kennedy versus Trump uh, at the final stages because, uh, and because I think uh, Kennedy, I, I'm not well versed with American politics because I'm here in Europe, uh, but as I see it, uh, Kennedy was from the Democrat side and he then dropped out of the party to be independent runner. But if he would be 
the Democrat frontrunner, I would, I would love to see those debates because I think that could be actually interesting to have two presidential candidates who try to fight who's more Bitcoin focused. And I think Kennedy would win that battle, uh, being more uh, Bitcoin focused. That would be amazing. I heard you say that um, you don't know any candidates in Europe who really focus on Bitcoin. No, unfortunately not. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because in Austria, like Europe is not the same organized as Europe. Uh, um, Europe is not as same organized as, as America. Um, but I did not see any candidate from the European, uh, leadership, even though they're not voted directly anyways, like the, you, the European uh, president, the commissioner, they are voted indirectly, not directly by the people. Uh, so we don't hear a lot from them anyways, because we cannot even vote on them. Uh, and from the Austrian parties, there's not even a single word of Bitcoin crypto or anything. Uh, in their uh, strategies and uh, in, in programs, so I'm like completely disappointed, and I hope this 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 changes in the next few years. Now that America showed that you actually have to talk about that, uh, and Europe, Europe will Europe will will change that. But uh, you first heard, and I heard that story from you. You first heard about Bitcoin with a multi-level marketing scheme. Is that is that right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> how, how did this happen? So I, w I was living in Zimbabwe at the time with my family. My family live in Zimbabwe. And Zimbabwe, as many people know, has one of the highest inflations in the world. But Zimbabwe is a little unusual. Like many other countries, it uses the Zim dollar and then it uses the US dollar. So people who get paid in the Zim dollar they are the ones who are subject to that very high inflation of over 100% a year often. And then the people who get paid in U.S., well, they think the U.S. is a great currency, you know, compared to what every, those other people are getting paid. Um, so that's another issue. But while I was there, I, I still saw that there was a problem with inflation even in the U.S., and when when I went to this multi-level marketing group, it was they they were investing in Bitcoin miners, which was even harder for me to understand at the time. So, but I understood the miners were, you know, doing the transactions for Bitcoin. But and they said this is much better. And then at the end of the the talk, they said, and we've got this other new product, Ethereum, and it's even better than Bitcoin. So I said, okay, well, I'll invest in both. Yeah, let's do it. Um, and that's how I first got introduced to it. And yeah, like I said, I kind of heard about it right at the top of that cycle. And when it completely crashed, I got very nervous and tried to get out. <laughs> it was, it was a different setup. So I wasn't in self custody or anything, but I, it just taught me that not understanding the Bitcoin cycles and the volatility was, I needed to learn that. Otherwise, I w wasn't going to invest in this asset. Yeah, hmm. it's it's something that you kind of have to learn to understand. Like, oh shit, the, the, it's volatile, we're still early, and those drops can actually happen. It's not just a story from the past. Um, but I'm more curious, like, what did you learn, uh, especially from Zimbabwe, um, about Bitcoin? Because Zimbabwe is like, uh, I think a country where you see the problems of the fiat currency way better than in Europe and America. Yeah. So I've always, my family still live in Zimbabwe and I, I have a big place in my heart for the people in Zimbabwe. You know, I realized that my my parents were born in Africa. My grandparents were born in Africa, uh, but we're not really true Africans. <laughs> we're we're we came from Denmark and Germany and UK originally, and we settled there. And so the people, it's been an interesting experience growing up there, and and living with that currency because in two thousand and eight. You know, that was the biggest crash Zimbabwe ever had. And I, I remember seeing my dad with suitcases of money, 
um, every day just trying to spend it as as quick as possible because it just devalued uh, every day. And and so I saw that. Then I came back in 2017. We're, we're now um, still, people are still using the same Zimbabwe currency and the US dollar and still dealing with the same problems. Um, for people that get paid in the Zimbabwe currency, I don't know how they survive um, because every month, everything goes up double. And even if you do have US dollars in Zimbabwe, because of the way the government's structured, they can just put up the taxes to bring in goods and that makes the prices go up. So prices are usually going up for all people who live there and uh, they do find a way, uh, but it's it's not an easy way to live. So when I saw that, um, I... I knew there was a problem with inflation, but I thought the U.S. dollar was a pretty good alternative at first. How, how do they get the, the salary? This is always a question in my mind because like salary, usually it's like once a year you negotiate uh, or like because right now I'm self-employed, so my salary is like just what I bring in. But uh, before I was six years in a company and I know that salary was always a discussion, but not like every month it, it, was, it was maybe a discussion like all eight months or all 18 months or depending on how long you have been here and and if you're making moves in the company how is that when the the currency just goes up or like the currency goes up the inflation of the currency goes up so quick that you basically need to double your salary every month just to keep up and have the same purchasing power so it's the difference between government employees and private employees. So the government play, pays all of the teachers and the p police and the army with the Zimbabwe dollar. And the, the equivalent is probably between 100 and 300 US dollars a month. People have to live on 100 and 300 dollars a month. Then private companies, they can pay their employees anything. Um, and they pay in, in U.S. sometimes. So it just depends who you work for. Um, and and the government does not increase, obviously, their salaries with inflation. They cause the inflation by printing money. And they give their, their employees the same amount of money. And the, the employee has to find a way to survive with the same amount of money. So you really see it firsthand. Um, uh, my brother owns his own company there. He builds, he builds houses. And so he mostly makes us dollars. He's not as affected as the people who get paid in Zim dollars. So it's, it's a big difference. Yeah. Do, do they get, uh, properties like, like Bitcoin more uh, than in the U S or is it still, they don't, they don't get Bitcoin. They, they read it like, Oh, I want the U S dollars, not Bitcoin. Exactly. Most people want the US dollars, not Bitcoin. There is a small movement now in Zimbabwe and people, I went to a Bitcoin meetup uh, where I'm from and they are starting and they, are, they, um, it's, it's from an outside company. I think it might be a German company that is teaching people about Bitcoin and there are people that are starting to use it. And I am, I'm going to be talking with some of those people in the coming weeks, but um, yeah, I the the one thing that I learned while I was there is there's real there's not a real on ramp to Bitcoin. There's no Coinbase. There's no you know um, any of these companies that we use in the Western world. If people want to buy Bitcoin, they buy peer to peer, and um, so that's not easy uh, to to do yet. But I, I heard that there is a company going to be starting there. Um, and yeah, because it is there in South Africa. I know there are companies that you can easily buy Bitcoin and we live right next to South Africa. So whatever South Africa gets eventually comes to Zimbabwe and other African countries. So yeah, there it's, it's moving forward, but most people, most people are just 
the US dollar would be better than, Z than the Zimbabwe dollar there at that point. Do, do they have uh, online peer-to-peer -peer or actual physically meeting peer-to-peer? -peer? From what I heard, it's meeting peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, they might be via WhatsApp, it, online, yeah, via WhatsApp, but I heard it was meeting. <laughs> so. Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, uh, even in, in, in Germany and in developed countries or like in Austria, like we have two, act like Austria, such a small country has two Bitcoin only exchanges happening here. And we have in, in Swiss, a great, great one. We have in Germany ones. So like, it's, it's interesting. We have so many, but people still, uh, the hardcore Bitcoiners want peer to peer Bitcoin because they don't want KYC and stuff like that. But in Zimbabwe, Probably they don't care about Q KYC and stuff like that. Not that much. They just want to preserve the financial energy. Exactly. Exactly. And many people there probably don't have bank accounts. Some do, but the bank accounts charge such high fees that people, yeah, probably just want, they just want to get some Bitcoin once they learn about, you know, the properties of it. Is it more free to a certain extent? because the financial police there is probably also uh, not as powerful as they in, in, in Europe, in the European Union, uh, where they control and monitor everything. And then they, they're seeing all the computer programs. They're like, oh, there's some fishy thing. Let's let's call there. Um, so it, it, it's probably a little bit more Wild West than the Zimbabwe. Yes. You know, I think it's such a small amount that they're not concerned with it. You know, the gold market in Zimbabwe is heavily monitored and everything goes through the government. Uh, but Bitcoin is still so small. I, I don't think they worry about it too much. Okay. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> um, what, so you're back in, in, in America, uh, and what do you say to, to your American friends or colleagues or people who you just meet in America who say, if you have those uh, people in your life who say that inflation is good. <laughs> like, how, how do you, and I yeah, hear that from even friends of mine. What, what do you say to them to make them open their eyes to say like, oh no, in, inflation is not good. And why not even a little bit inflation? They always do, go ahead then to me like, oh yeah, they have like hundreds and hundreds of percent of inflation. That's bad. <laughs> But a little inflation, that's good. I mean, we need that 2-3% of inflation. Like, what do you s t tell them? So, th so that's funny. I haven't heard inflation is good. But what I think I hear is that inflation is normal. You know, I think we have been so ingrained to believing that that 2-3% is normal that nobody thinks beyond that. And And for most people in the U.S., and I'm in Miami, especially... I see a lot of people doing very well. Yes, we are we are struggling with inflation. I mean, during COVID, I saw that you know, I buy organic food in in America because the regular food here is not very good <laughs> and or healthy. So I buy organic and organic food went up at least 30%. Um and so When that happened, I thought, wow, you know, it's not just two or three percent, it's not ten percent, it's thirty percent in some areas. And people so people see that inflation is happening and that's too high for people, but I don't I think they think a little bit of inflation is normal. And plus people that I know, you know, do pretty well. And when you do pretty well, you can handle a little bit. You can handle it's not that you like it, but you can handle it. So I haven't found a way, you know, to get to the why Bitcoin yet with many of my friends because they still, they don't see a need for it. And when I talk about Bitcoin, they're, oh yeah, you're, you're into Bitcoin and that's about it. Nobody wants to know more. Is the pain not high enough? Is, is, is the, the, they live in, in, in too good of a world still? Some, some people do. Yeah, I, I have some, I, I do real estate here and I have some friends that, um, and colleagues that do real estate and do very well. And the pain is not high. The life is, is very good for some people. And, and yeah, I think that's exactly right. You know, the reason that I got into Bitcoin is because I stopped enjoying part of what I was doing. 
And so when I stopped enjoying part of what I was doing, and then I also had a good friend just suddenly die in a car accident, I suddenly said to myself, life is too short. Life is too short to be doing things that I don't enjoy. And it kind of hit me in a way, you know, in, in Bitcoin, um, we often talk about that um, your most valuable resource is time. And I've heard that, but I really felt it when that happened. I don't want to spend my time working in something I don't enjoy um, when when life can can be short. <laughs> so I got I started looking into Bitcoin when I when I realized that. And I think for many people, many people don't um, get to that point. You know, I think there has to be pain. Like you said, there has to be enough pain either in 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 your finances or in your life to bring you to study Bitcoin. Why is Bitcoin for for the time aspect so important? I I, I feel like um, when when you talk about Bitcoin, it gives you back time, uh, but a lot of people still struggle with that concept. Um, why was in the time where you felt like, oh, I don't enjoy what I'm doing. Um, uh, I want to, to change something. I value my time. But wh why was Bitcoin so present in that, in that moment? Hmm, that's a good question. Because I realized that if I saved in a vehicle that would preserve my savings, then I could have more time to do what I want. And and what I really want to do, I I don't want to buy fancy cars and all of that. I I want to travel and see my family. I want to yeah travel occasionally and see the world. I want to buy organic food, and I and I want to live the life I want to live. So it was more about that I want to spend my time wisely, and rather than doing things that I really don't want to do. I'm not sure if that answered the question. It, it definitely answers that. It, and it's, it's, it's really cool to, to, to see that. Um, you also t t uh, said that you were in real estate. Are you still doing something in real estate and what are you doing there? Yeah, so I still do real estate. I'm, I'm a real estate agent in Miami and I, I work with clients. I, I work mostly with elderly clients, which I do enjoy. I work with like working with the elderly clients, but I, you know, I, I, I what I don't enjoy is working. Real estate is one of those professions that you can do hundreds of hours and not get paid. You can show a, a time, a house 50 times, and then the buyer can decide, no, I'm not buying and you don't make one cent. And I found that people expect you to do that. And that's the part I don't enjoy. I It's kind of expected for a realtor. And, and I know that many people say realtors make too high a commission. Well, that's actually changing in Florida now. Um, but, but good realtors work hard and they're worth it. But people just have this idea that realtors need to work whether they're paid or not because they make such high commission. And I don't enjoy that feeling. I don't enjoy that feeling. So I enjoy working with people who respect my time <laughs> and I respect theirs. But um, there's there's two sides to, you know, the real estate market here. And then, of course, I, from studying Bitcoin, you know, I often hear people say, I, you know, my house is going down when I, when I price it in Bitcoin. And my goal when I first got into real estate was to buy properties as a store of value so that I could store wealth and make passive income. And then I started studying Bitcoin and I thought, maybe this is a better way. Maybe, you know, not dealing with the renters not dealing with the taxes, not dealing with all the things that come with owning property. Um, I, I didn't love that part. I really don't love that part. <laughs> it's, it's, it is, um, 
it is it is obviously a privilege to have extra houses and to manage them and to make passive income from that but the idea of storing my money in bitcoin uh as i get older makes more sense to me than than buying properties the only thing that i that i would say is the passive income would be nice um from real estate at the moment it's it's a it's more of a bitcoin's more of a storage value for me if you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis i guess you already bought some bitcoin and now the most important step is to keep the bitcoin keep them secure in a hardware wallet my personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the bitbox it's super secure it's simple to set up it's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the bitcoin on an exchange and you can get a five percent discount with the code robin at the checkout visit bitbox dot swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and if you really want to bulletproof your self custody setup your security setup and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure, if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable, or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. Yeah, the the passive income is interesting. I mean, there are the there is the possibilities to do it with Bitcoin miners. Uh, there are solutions out there, uh, whether you do it yourself or you rent something. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's always like, or you can even buy um, a machine, let it host there and, and split the income with, with other, bit, uh, my, uh, other miners that host for you. So like the passive income could be something with Bitcoin even. Um, but the, like, the general thing is what, what Bitcoin is trying to do is just like, be, being perfect money uh, and, and money has no yield even though we really would like it to have it uh, <laughs> that, that's why there's the celsius things and F, uh, ftx not because of that but ftx also blew up but celsius was so successful and then they blew up uh because there is no yield on bitcoin and people try to put a yield on it on it i mean there's always the way to do to, to get a loan against your bitcoin uh, uh, if you can pay off the, 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 the payments and installments, uh, that could be an interesting option, uh, to discover, uh, I myself don't do that. I don't recommend it. Uh, but, uh, it's always something worth, worth, uh, exploring. Um, and, but why did you then choose Bitcoin over real estate? I think that, that we had that a couple of times of, on the podcast already that real estate versus Bitcoin and even myself, like I was going into real estate right before I discovered Bitcoin. And then I did not go into real estate. I talked about that story on the podcast already. Um, but why did you not go into real estate and then stick with Bitcoin? So I'm still working in real estate, but I see, I see more and more the more i study bitcoin i see more the value of bitcoin so much so that um i did i owned a property it was a condo in miami and i sold that property because well for two reasons i i always believe that we all need a place to live right and i and i think having a home i know some people choose to rent and that's fine I don't, the one thing I don't like about renting is your landlord can say at any time, you know, I'm selling and then you have to move. And that, that's one reason I like to own. Uh, but the, this property that I had, uh, the, we have a problem in Florida with very high condo association fees. And in 2025, they're going to get even higher for many condos. And that's because of the, Surfside building in Miami that collapsed. So the state made it, the laws very, um, very tight for Florida condos in 2025. So that's coming. And so I wanted to sell my condo because I don't want to pay double the amount of fees. 
but I also saw the opportunity to put the money into Bitcoin as a better store of value going forward. And, you know, at the time, that was a little while ago, I, I, I do still want that money to put back into property. So I did put it into the ETFs, which I know for many Bitcoiners is a no-no. But I, the reason I did that was because I wanted to put, sell it at some point and put it back into property. Now I'm kind of rethinking things. And I, as I learn more about Bitcoin, I know that having Bitcoin in self-custody is obviously the most important thing because that is what true self-sovereignty is. Um, I also put some in Tesla, which I heard you used to invest in, um, just, yeah, to keep up with with inflation, right? I mean, you put in those kind of things because I'm um, trying to keep up with inflation and then at a later date buy another property. But, um, yeah, so that was an interesting and a nerve-wracking experience. But the reason I did it, there was two big reasons. One, because uh, the condo fees are going up too high. And then two, because I see that va the value of Bitcoin is going to outpace the value of real estate long term. Yeah, and I think that's that's a major thing. Like when once you get to Bitcoin, where Bitcoin is your personal hurdle rate, it's hard to invest in anything else. Like once you get like, oh, Bitcoin is my hurdle rate and you measure everything in Bitcoin, also your other investments measured in Bitcoin. Uh, also like even, even the Tesla charts probably looks a, a lot less different, a lot, uh, a lot different once you measure Tesla in Bitcoin, uh, especially long term. Uh, but yeah, it was a, it was a big, big bit, uh, Tesla belief. I think still that they have a big future. Um, but I just, uh, enjoy that I don't, don't have to worry about what a management team has to do. Like Tesla is an amazing company, but they still could do some weird thing, uh, or that I don't like, uh, I did till now they are executing really good and I love the cars. I love the products. Um, but the peace of mind of, of Bitcoin, not having to worry about anything, just like saving it, uh, securely in your self custody. A uh, wall that you have uh, for yourself. Um, that's that's peace of mind. That's a lot worth to me right now. And also, like with real estate, it's it's a lot worth that I don't have to uh, be like, oh, there's some some rent off of of my property ca calling me that the the toilet is not working or that and that. And and I don't have to worry about either doing it myself or hiring someone that does it for me. That's more like a business. And as a business side, I just want to focus with, uh, with Bitcoin content creation and on a financial savings side, I just want to save Bitcoin. That that's what I want to do. Uh, and at least the next 10 years, I put it out uh, yesterday as a tweet. And uh, that's like my, my ded dedication now for the next 10 years. Uh, and it's, it's a, it's a great thing, thing to do, but you're like living in Miami. That's, uh, that's really cool. Um, are you considering moving to another country if, if America does something weird with Bitcoin? I, I mean, it does not look like that right now, but is, is there, if anything, you're like, maybe let's go to El Salvador, maybe let's go to other jurisdictions? I have thought about it. I've thought about it. My family, as I said, they live in Zimbabwe, so that's where I go back most of the time. But I have, I have looked at places like Portugal, Spain, El Salvador, um, but it, you know, it's at this point in life, most of my friends are either in Miami and my family in Zimbabwe. So it doesn't make sense for me right now to move, but I would consider, I would consider it. That is really cool. Where do you see, um, when we talk about Bitcoin in the future, where do you see it in like the next 20 years? Uh, where do you see the, the developments, uh, going? I always love to, to see where it's going longer term and i think 20 years for some reason is one of my favorite <laughs> time frames i feel like 10 years is too short-sighted uh, and and 30 40 50 years is just way too far in the future for me uh, to look at and 20 years is kind of a nice middle ground uh, where do you see it in, in 20 years well robin i think you are an incredible young visionary because i can barely see 10 years out so i I think I would like to hear from you where you see it in 20 years, 
uh, because for me, I, I'm just hopeful that we're closer to a Bitcoin standard, but I'd love to know we, what you think. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm working actually on a, I'm working on a theory uh, and this theory started as just a Google Docs. Uh, then it developed into a, an, an article. Uh, it's still a, in a Google Docs saved. But at first it was like that's a note thing. Uh, and now it's like nine, 10 pages or something like that, uh, with just ideas, but not thought out ideas. It's just like two sentence or three sentence ideas. And those ideas, I have to kind of summarize and then think them uh, to the end. And there might be some, it's definitely too long for an article <laughs> at this point. <laughs> uh, so I might make an, a book out of it. I don't know if I sell a book, maybe I just give out a PDF because, uh, it's, it's, then I also have to market it and, and, and think about all that stuff. I, I might do it, but I don't know if may, maybe I just release a PDF, but some like the hard copy. So I might do it with Amazon or something like that. Um, because I have a lot of ideas where the future of Bitcoin is going and how this future will look like. And this is due to my guests, like, I think about the future a lot myself, but the most of the ideas are inspired by my podcast episodes. So that book, when it is a book, I don't know what, what I will do with, with, with that now, but I think I will make a book. That book will probably be a more of a con condensed summary, summary of uh, exactly uh, all those things that the guests already sparked, the, the, the things that I heard from them, the things that I heard from them in the future. So it, it will be interesting. Uh, and if I think that 2044, we could be looking at a full Bitcoin standard, uh, where fiat currencies are still there, but you can almost everywhere pay with Bitcoin. You have at some rest, some countries already. Uh, Bitcoin as a unit of account, not all the countries, I think because different countries have different paces. Uh, I mean, we already started seeing that with El Salvador. When you go to some restaurants there, there are Satoshi prices written and US dollar prices. So to a cer certain extent, it's already here. But 2044 is, I feel like, the time where we really see a Bitcoin adoption, where we really see a um, a major Bitcoin adoption where you can just have your Bitcoin wallet and be fine. You, you don't have to have a bank account. I mean, there is a, as a beach Bitcoin is, is like was on a podcast. And I think this was the first company that was on a podcast that said, Oh yeah, we, we don't have a Bitcoin. Uh, we don't have an, uh, fiat account. We just have Bitcoin and they live in Switzerland, middle of Europe. It's not El Salvador. Uh, and, and they only have a Bitcoin account and they do everything with that. So, uh, it's, it, it's closer than we think, but it's just not yet mainstream. And in 20 years, it might as well be mainstream. You have those pictures from where in, in 1921 or something like that was there was one uh, car and a bunch of horses. Uh, and then like 10, 20 years later, it, it was the other way around. So uh, also with cell phone adoption uh, against the landline, and that was pretty quick. Uh, look back 20 years, nobody had a cell phone at the hand. And, and now uh, you, you have to lock your phone into some safe to, to not be addicted to it. So <laughs> it's... We, we will get addicted to Bitcoin. Uh, that that's kind of my my future. I'm already addicted to Bitcoin. Uh, I, I I want to buy more, even though I don't have any fiat left. That's that's a <laughs> I, I have to fight that addiction. Uh, so that's that's kind of where I see see it going uh, in in the long run. Uh, and it could be five years. Uh, it could be fifty years. Uh, but I think it will be 20 years. I'm looking at like 2044. I also laughed out loud when I saw the Michael Saylor presentation because I'm ahead, actually have a document named 2044, even like long before Michael Saylor came on the stage. And then he came on the stage and said 2045. <laughs> <laughs> so now, now if I actually give a book out and say, call it 2044, everyone will say I'm a copycat from Michael Saylor, but uh, I, I can live with that. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, do you, do you have any? Just yeah. one thing on that. I I know what you mean when you say you're addicted to Bitcoin. I, when when I when I saw it go down, you know, in price, I always look. Do I have more fiat that I can buy buy more? Um, and I know that focusing on price is is not the best way, but but it but you know we buy it in fiat, so it matters. I can buy more when it's lower. <laughs> I think right now the price actually matters. Uh, I think the, the whole thing of like, oh, the fiat price does not matter. It's like, of course it matters because right now in my supermarket, uh, the unit of account is euros. And for you, it is US dollars. Um, if I buy anything, uh, it's in euros. So like, of course it matters right now. But what those Bitcoiners, fi uh, want to say with that, it's like, it will not matter in maybe 20, 30, 40 years from now. Will be, uh, I think so too, uh, but right now it's a great signal. It's like the, it, it gives the signal of, of, of Bitcoin to us all. Uh, <laughs> how, how well are we doing right now? How, what, where are we in, in the, in the journey? The, the purchasing power of Bitcoin says something about the, overall uh, perception of the public of Bitcoin. I think that's, that's uh, a good way to, to put it, uh, locally. Yeah. I think that's, that's a, that's a good way to see it. Do you see it? Um, do, do you have some, because you said like more near term, like five years, is, is there, do you have some framework to think about that or, uh, you, you don't want to look, look too far? Five years time, greater adoption. I, I, I see more and more people coming into the space all the time and and whenever i look at those charts there's there's more wallets there's more more adoption there's more people asking about it and and i agree i think price is important i think when bitcoin hits a hundred thousand more people are gonna say what's this about it's just we're so we are so entrenched in, in the price aspect for now. So it gets people in kind of like you said in the beginning, you know, you come for the number go up, but you stay for the revolution. And I, and, and I think more and more people will feel the pain as our governments print more money and as inflation continues to affect everybody. So yeah, I just see more and more adoption. And I think more and more people will come in and you also came in with, with creating content in the space. Uh, what is it called? The Bitcoin edge? Uh, is it right? Yeah. So I just started with that is another way for me to try to find a way to give back um, and get the message out about Bitcoin. I, I don't, I would love to work and spend more of my time in Bitcoin. Um, so this was just one way of trying something new to see um, how it goes. And yeah, I, I enjoy, like you, I enjoy speaking to people about Bitcoin. Uh, not all of my friends want to talk about it. My family don't. I can have little conversations here and there, but nobody wants to hear about it for very long. And, you know, I like to be reminded, um, nobody wants to be told what to do. So when, when you create a podcast or you put some content out there, the people who are interested and attracted to it will find you rather than trying to force people that I care about or know into it. If they're interested, they'll find it. What do you think is, is uh, for people that you know that are not as interested in Bitcoin right now, what's the hurdle? Like what? Is, is, is it just the time missing or like what, what's the, the hurdle why they don't uh, come into Bitcoin now? I feel like it's it's so obvious, but maybe we're just in a small bubble and it feels so obvious, but it's not that obvious. I think it's lack of understanding and education because I think people, the two reasons, lack of education, which I myself had, I didn't fully understand Bitcoin until I read The Price of Tomorrow by Jeff Booth and then the Bitcoin Standard because I didn't understand anything about central banks and the history of money. I didn't know any of that. And I and for to have one conversation with people you know and to put all of that in there is not easy. They 
you know, they, they are lost by five minutes. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, I think education and then also lack of pain. Like we said before, I think some people are doing quite well and are quite fine with how things are in this, in this environment. And I think, I think you need either that pain catalyst or uh, something that brings you in, whether it's creating a better world for everybody, because I, you know, the world is going to be a better place on the Bitcoin standard. There, there's less reason to cheat. There's, it's more fair. It, I, I also like that. I like that places in Africa will, will not have to use the, the US dollar and, all over the world will not have to use the US dollar, but they can have another system that is e more equal to everybody than than being controlled by, say, the top. This is this is such a big thing when we think about uh, the the US dollar having such an am amazing power over the world. They can just export their own inflation like that. That's something nice. <laughs> they can just print and make others pay in parts for that. Like that's an, that's a very nice business model was the US, USA, US dollars has there going, uh, really, really interesting. Um, but, uh, it, <laughs> I think Bitcoin might bring it down and I hope, uh, especially that, that, that Bitcoin will bring it down. Uh, but anyways, if you have Bitcoin, you don't, you're not relying on that, even if it do doesn't go down, because I rather concentrate on, on building something than uh, to, f to fight something down. Uh, it's, it's always, always easier and better to do that. Um, closer to the end of the podcast, um, I always ask one question to my guests. What can we learn from you besides Bitcoin and all the things that we talked about? Well, I think the thing that I'm most passionate about besides Bitcoin is holistic health. And, you know, before I got into real estate, I've been in the health and fitness industry my whole life before that. And, you know, I, I realized as, as I went through that you can be fit and not healthy. You can, you can look good on the outside, but not be healthy on the inside. So health, holistic health is a more complete view of health. It, it involves managing stress. It involves getting good sleep. It involves eating high quality foods and drinking high quality water. And it also involves your purpose and happiness because you can have all of that. And if you're not happy and not living your purpose, you know, what's the point? <laughs> so I like holistic health. Um, and, and it has worked for me. I, I haven't missed a day of work in over 20 years. I have a very strong immune system and I believe it's because I put a lot of that into practice. Not perfectly, but I've been doing it for a long time. And so, yes, I, I do believe health is wealth, but, but Bitcoin is also part of that wealth. Uh, I also need to be financially in the right place to enjoy my health. So I need both. Definitely. If you have to choose, it's always health, <laughs> but you, 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 you need both because if, if, if you are healthy and not wealthy over time, your health will also suffer from that. So it's, it's, it's the kind of, they kind of need each other. Um, on that topic is a really cool end routine question where we have to end routine. The previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is. Uh, your question is, what is the one dream which you would spend a big chunk of your Bitcoin on? That's a good question. I would spend a big chunk on of my Bitcoin on on a home that I really loved. A home, I would spend it on a home and traveling with my family. Those are mm. the two things that I would spend my Bitcoin on. Yeah, home comes up. Uh, I think a lot with with, with Bitcoiners. They want want to own their their home and Bitcoin. That's it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the thing that Bitcoin I want. Uh, really cool. Thank you, Paula, for for being uh, on my show today. Um, when people want to reach out to you, I want to see your uh, show. Where can people uh, find you? 
So I'm on the Bitcoin Edge on YouTube and I am on Twitter under my name. Perfect. Then thank you for, for joining us today, uh, Paula. Also for everyone watching and listening for joining us today. Uh, as always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.